Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this veterinary interns and residents webinar in a collaboration with VIN Foundation and VIN students. My name is Jordan Benchia. I'm the executive director of the VIN Foundation and we're thrilled to have you with us. As I mentioned, this is a collaboration with VIN students and VIN Foundation. So in the background of this webinar, we have Dr. Miranda Spindel, who is the lead team lead of VIN students. Um, we have, of course, Dr. Tony Bartels, who is also on the VIN student team, as well as the VIN Foundation board member. And there's also Dr. Matt Holland, another VIN Foundation board member, and also on the VIN student team. So we've covered our bases here, and Dr. Matt Holland and myself will be answering questions in the background. I'm going to go through a couple housekeeping tips before we go and turn it over to Dr. Bartels. So you will notice at the very bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A window. Please put all of your questions there. There's also an option to upvote. So if you see a question that you think is relevant and you want to make sure gets answered, go ahead and give that a thumbs up and that'll bump that up to the top of the list. And that helps us know that that's a question we really need to make sure it gets answered. Um, then there's also the chat window. Please only use the chat window for any technical questions, or if you're just joining us, go ahead and share where you are joining us from geographically. But we wanna keep all the questions in the Q&A window. That helps us track the questions and make sure that we answer all of them. And throughout the webinar, I will be chiming in a couple times and sharing questions live for Dr. Bartels to answer. And if we don't get through your question during the live um, presentation part, we will do it at the end of the presentation, still during the live part, but we will just do it at the end of the presentation if it's not very specific to the content that Dr. Bartels is covering during the presentation. So again, any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A window. There are no stupid questions. You are able to ask anonymously. You have a phenomenal resource here in Dr. Tony Bartels. So I highly, highly encourage you to ask the questions. Um, and I assure you, if you've asked them, other people have asked them before and it helps other people learn too. So please ask questions. And um, with that, I am gonna go ahead um, and turn it over to Tony. One more thing I'm gonna say is that everybody by registering will receive an email within a couple of days with a recording of the webinar along with a PDF checklist. So keep a lookout in your email from studentdebt at binfoundation.org. That will be coming within a couple of days. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony. Take it over, Tony. Great, thank you, Jordan. So uh, thanks everyone for joining. It looks like we have uh, uh, you know, quite a wide geographical representation tonight, which is great. I'm sure everybody's uh, scattering and, and getting started with their internships, residencies. And this is, this, is, um, this is one that I've always wanted to do for, uh, for a number of years now, um, mostly because I still think the predominant um, reflex reaction in most of the medical professions that involve any kind of advanced training like internships and residencies are still kind of operating under the assumption that deferring your student loans is the best way to handle them. And unfortunately, that's just not the case any longer, particularly with the, um, the federal income driven repayment options and public service loan forgiveness. And you, know, you have to do a little bit more work on the front end, particularly as you're getting started in those uh, positions to set yourself up to take advantage of all those benefits that can come with your federal student loans. And it's always kind of been heart wrenching to me when I get people that reach out, you know, in the middle of their residency or after they finish their residency and now they're working in academia and they're like, oh, I, you know, tell me more about this public service loan forgiveness. And it's like, mm, if we just got you like four years earlier, you'd be halfway there practically by now. So um, good on you for joining, spread the word as well. We also want to know in conjunction with doing this with, with VIN students, we want you to know that VIN is a free resource for you in your advanced education track, right? So interns at academic institutions have free access to VIN, just like you had free access to VIN as a student. Residents have free access to VIN during their residency and all academicians have free access to VIN as well, right? So we want you to be part of the VIN community. We want you to, to help get you through that advanced training that's excruciating, excruciating and rigorous um, and then contribute back to the community, right? So, but as part of that, um, we can even get you the answers you need for your student loan, right? So we do things like this tonight. 
Uh, I'll be sharing with you too, uh, some information about the VIN student debt message board folder, which is where we do personal consultations to get more into the nitty gritty, right? We can only answer, uh, you know, more, more generic questions in formats like this. And, and eventually, if you have more specific questions unique to your circumstance, we have to, you know, we have to dive into the specifics. And we do that on the VIN student debt message board folder. You also have the option to post anonymously in there. Uh, and still get the answers you need, but then the community gets to learn from that as well. So that's that's kind of how VIN is built. Um, tell me a little bit, before we get started, tell me a little bit about who you are, uh, which helps me know uh, more about how to kind of cater this content on the fly. I see some pretty good participation here. I'll just let this run for a few more, a few more minutes. Oh, great. Thanks, Megan. Wow. I see this is super encouraging. Well, I guess the, the majority here are actually residents, which is like, you know, finding the zebras. Thank you for showing up. It's really hard for, you know, for to get you all to, um, you know, to squeeze anything else into those schedules that you're all trying to navigate. So great, good on you for being here. And, and um, hopefully we can get all those questions answered to make sure that you're on the right path uh, with your student loans. All right, so let me stop sharing those and we'll dive in here. Okay, so I'm going to approach student loans like we approach our cases, right? So we're going to have you do physical exams annually, ideally, uh, on your student loans, right? Because things change and you want to stay ahead of those changes and make sure that what we talk about now and what you think is a good repayment plan for you is still the best repayment option for you the following year, right? And the way that we do these physical exam and diagnostics, we're going to show you how to obtain the information you need to really critically and objectively look at your student loans. Uh, so we're gonna visit the studentaid.gov website and look for your student aid data file. And then we're gonna take that information and use a lot of the tools that are freely available on the VIN Foundation Student Debt Center uh, that are built specifically for veterinarians to answer um, the questions you have about um, student loan repayment. And why now, right? Because again, you know, the, the, the couple of times that I've been able to introduce these concepts to uh, interns and, and residents and specialists, it's usually after the fact, right? After they've already kind of gone through that training and, you know, there's no going back in time, right? Or at least not yet. Um, so this was just a few uh, comments that we've received in the past and on the message boards, you know, knowing about this seven years earlier, particularly if you're working towards public service loan forgiveness, you want to make sure that that happens sooner rather than later. Um, again, most of our colleagues, most of the medical community are still kind of uh, fighting that conventional wisdom of you know, deferment being best. And, and I, I'm gonna blame a lot of your mentors for that because that's probably what most of them did with their student loans. And that was the best option for them at the time. But you, you all have access to a lot better uh, repayment options than they did, right? So knowing how those work um, can help you uh, get out of student debt faster and also save you tens of thousands of dollars. All right, so this is really all about trying to reduce that stress and, and improve that loan repayment success for when you do finish that advanced training and, and start earning those incomes that are more commens commensurate with your advanced specialty training. So when I do provide assistance to our veterinary colleagues, again, I treat these like medical cases and I ask them for their, their student loan history and signalment. And here's a little bit of mine, right? So I'm married to vet household with no kids yet. Uh, we uh, both attended Colorado State. Uh, my wife graduated in 2009 ahead of me. Uh, she was an out-of-state student at uh, Colorado State and went on to do an internship, fellowship, and then residency in small animal internal medicine. And now she's a specialist practicing here in Denver where we live. Um, I went more the GP route. I did a combined MBA, DVM at Colorado State. 
and I was um, an in-state resident at Colorado State, and I thought I was doing all of the best things I possibly could do to keep my student debt low. And together, we still finished veterinary school with uh, more than $400,000 of student debt. So um, things happen, right? And we have to be able to navigate those on the fly and figure out what the best repayment strategy is going forward. Uh, for us or for anybody who finishes uh, veterinary school or if you put your loans, let's say you put your loans in a deferment using that conventional wisdom for the full advanced training, then after you complete that training, they'll put your loans into a, a standard 10 year plan. That's the default repayment plan for federal student loans. And the way that works is they take your principal, your interest, and they calculate the monthly payment required to pay that balance to zero over a 10 year time frame. Uh, for us, that would have been $4,500 per month, which wasn't very realistic since we weren't even earning $4,500 per month, right? So uh, not very feasible. Stumble upon these income driven repayment options. So these are some of these benefits that come with federal student loans, at least since about 2009, where they've been um, much more favorable. But as the name implies, the payment is a function of your income. So rather than paying $4,500 per month under the standard 10 year plan, we could pay instead $1,400 per month. And we since switched to a plan called revised pay as you earn, which is another type of income driven repayment plan. And that got us down to $930 per month. All right, so now we have a much more manageable repayment strategy that allows us to have a financial plan that involves something other than just paying back our student loans. And I saw uh, for many of you that submitted the registration um, form and a question with it or a comment, a lot of you are concerned with, you know, how are you going to buy a home or start a business or start a family? And, and this is one of the ways that, you know, you can open up that door to doing so is, is, is you can pay based on your income rather than paying uh, based on the principal, the interest rate and time. The pandemic has uh, impacted everybody uh, and it also has had some direct impacts to your student loans. Uh, so the COVID-19 forbearance that has been in place on federal student loans uh, since March um, has turned the interest off. So there's been no interest accrual and no payments are due if you had a payment due before then. Uh, and the time that we spend during this forbearance period also counts towards forgiveness if you're using an income driven repayment plan that has something um, that has forgiveness associated with it, right? So one of the side effects of using an income driven repayment plan is that if you still have a balance remaining after a certain period of time, it gets forgiven, but you may have to pay tax on that. Um, if you're working towards public service loan forgiveness, the forbearance, the pandemic forbearance time also counts towards that. Uh, the difference with public service loan forgiveness is you don't have to pay a tax after you meet those qualifications. And we'll talk about all those details uh, later. If you're working towards forgiveness using an income driven repayment plan, particularly the type of forgiveness that may trigger a taxable event, um, then you're better off paying the minimum and planning for that forgiveness. And that's what we're doing, right? So we're paying the minimum that's required by your income, but right now we don't have to pay anything because of the pandemic forbearance, uh, but we're also planning and saving for what we think the anticipated tax is going to be. And we're 70% of our way to the tax target with about 16 years to go uh, until we reach that, right? So essentially what that means is we're, we're ahead of schedule. So we're managing our student loans. We're also building our financial wellness plan and we're meeting our, our forgiveness target where we're working towards our forgiveness target. If you have federal student loans, the first stop we want to make is the studentaid.gov website and download your student aid data file. I'm going to take you guys over there uh, right now and show you. So if you haven't been in a while, uh, this is kind of a revamp of the studentaid.gov website that kind of brought a bunch of disparate websites together. Um, this has actually been a good thing. Um, instead of having to go to multiple places, you just have to go to one place now. So studentaid.gov, you're going to log in here using the same federal student aid credentials that you use when you were applying for student loans. Um, if it's been a while and you forgot what that is, you can actually reestablish that username and password or, the, or using the PIN if you still have the old school PIN number. You can you know, resurrect that uh, login um, using your social security number and, and, and they'll match you up being a borrower. But essentially, this is my share of the student debt balance. All right, so I have $171,000, um, 163 or 164 of that is principal. I have unpaid interest. Uh, this is another side effect we'll talk about in just a little bit of income driven repayment is you can have a situation where you have interest that accrues that you're not paying because maybe your payment doesn't 
doesn't exceed the interest that accrues each month. Uh, but one of the benefits of income driven repayment is this interest doesn't charge any more interest, right? It's actually not part of my principal. And I only get charged interest on the principal, not the unpaid interest. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, this isn't enough information to get me started. So I have to come over here to the view details. And this is going to take me to the, um, the aid summary dashboard. They use a various, uh, so the dashboard was the last page. So this is the aid summary. But essentially what I'm looking for is this download my aid data link. And you may need to be on a you know, laptop or something that allows you to download files to it with a relatively wide screen. Um, I've seen this link disappear if you're trying to do this on a phone, particularly an iPhone that doesn't like downloading files, right? So you may have to do this on a laptop or some other device that, that allows you to see this link. But this will essentially uh, grant you access to all of the ugly, hairy details of your federal student loan borrowing history, right? So I can save this my student data download. It comes in a text format, so a .txt file. Uh, that's okay. That's what we're looking for. It's this ugly looking file that has all of your um, higher education borrowing details. So save that to your computer and we'll come back and I'll show you how you can use that in just a little bit. Okay, so what are we gonna find in that student aid data file, this physical exam? What is it gonna reveal? It's gonna show you your loan types, the amounts that you have for each loan type, the interest rates normally, right? All of the interest rates for uh, qualifying federal student loans are set to zero right now. So it's a little harder to see what those interest rates are. If you're in repayment, it's gonna show you the repayment plan that you're using. This is gonna be really valuable, particularly during this um, pandemic forbearance period. So if you were using a repayment plan before then, it'll still have that information usually in your file and you can see what that plan was prior to the pandemic forbearance period. Any minimum payment you were making or whatever that minimum was uh, before you entered that pandemic forbearance. And then the terms and conditions, those are gonna be listed on the studentaid.gov website um, in your master promissory note. So the loans that you're gonna find in that file are direct loans, federal family education loans and Perkins loans, right? So these are uh, the Title IV loans, right? So um, direct loans have various subtypes, right? So direct unsubsidized, direct subsidized, direct grad plus loans, right? So those are gonna be the types of direct loans you're gonna find in there. Uh, federal family education loans, they don't exist anymore, meaning there's no new ones issued and they, they were phased out in 2010. So if you were in uh, higher education at any point Prior to 2010, you may find that you still have some of these older school fell program loans. I still have a little bit left from my undergrad. Uh, so that's another reason you want to check that file to see if you have these loan types because they're not always eligible for some of the newer income driven payment plans. Perkins loans is another type of federal student loan. Um, also not eligible for income driven repayment, but you can make them eligible. We'll talk about that too. Health profession student loans, loans for disadvantaged students, these are, these are a type of federal student loans. I do uh, see that a lot of the state schools or so graduates from the state schools will have these most frequently. Um, they're usually administered by the school, um, but you can consolidate them and also make them part of your uh, federal student loan repayment strategy and make them eligible for income driven repayment. Private student loans are, are pretty much anything that doesn't fall into this category. Right, so they're usually going to have a bank or lender name associated with it. So Wells Fargo or Discover is a popular one. Um, you know, Bank of America, any of those types of institutions can offer uh, private student loans. S Sally May has private is a private lender when it comes to student loans, uh, but those types of student loans are not eligible for uh, the federal income driven repayment plans. If you lose track of anything, a good habit to get into is checking your credit report. So annualcreditreport.com. Uh, you're eligible to request a free credit report from the three major reporting entities once per year. So this is a great habit to get into. Whenever I'm filing my taxes, I usually request my credit report as well, just to kind of get a snapshot of, is there anything on there that I'm not expecting? Am I missing anything? Um, so I would highly recommend that you do this. Um, this is not the same as your credit score, right? So your credit report is going to show you all of your open accounts, essentially, all of your lines of credit. Um, and it doesn't tell you your credit score. So accessing your free credit report doesn't impact your credit score, right? So I get that question a lot about, you know, does it impact my credit score? And those things are actually different. 
different things. Your federal student loans will also be filed on that credit report. What we're looking for in there is, you know, again, your current repayment plans, if there's any minimum monthly payments due, but again, the pandemic forbearance period has shut all those payments off for the time being. Um, are you paying anything above that? Are you eligible to use different repayment plans than you might currently be using? And then we can talk about how much should you pay. All right, so we're gonna take that student aid data file and we're gonna upload it into the VIN Foundation Student Debt Center, right? So I'm gonna take you over to the VIN Foundation Student Debt Center here. This is publicly available. You don't have to be a VIN member to use this, but as we kind of covered in the beginning, if you're doing an internship or residency, chances are you're gonna have free access to VIN anyway, right? So, but, you know, if you find that you don't have access to VIN in the future, you can still use these tools, right? It does not require you to have a VIN membership to use the tools that are available here. Anybody can use these, but they're designed specifically for veterinarians. But we're gonna come over here to the My Student Loans tool first. Now I'm gonna take that file that I just obtained from the studentaid.gov portal and I'm gonna upload it in here. So everybody, except for those of you that indicated your students and you're kind of you know, feeling this out, I'm gonna point you over to this. I have graduated for veterinary school option. I'm gonna upload that file. And I've got one here that we're gonna use as kind of an example. This is a recent graduate from Illinois, um, has uh, about $217,000 of federal student loans, um, direct loans mostly, uh, but also has a balance of about $29,000 of health profession student loans. Right? So again, those are not going to be found in this file, but you may know that you have those or you'll check your school website to see if you have uh, health profession student loans that are currently administered by the school and you can add them here. So I can add this health profession student loan balance because they're graduated and because these interest, these student loans don't accrue interest during school. Doesn't matter if we input them separately or together. All right, so this will add that to my total balance, right? And we can see here that I have a total balance of about $246,000. My weighted average interest rate, this is not accurate, right? Because the weighted average interest rates for all these loans that I borrowed during veterinary school and before are all set to zero because of that pandemic forbearance period, right? So this is a, um, this is an indication that, you know, we're gonna have to do some estimating, right? So it's harder to know exactly what those interest rates are. We can go back and look them all up, but that's a little bit of timely, time consuming exercise. We can make some pretty good guesses just based on the amount that we borrowed. Uh, one of the other, um, things I want to note in here is your repayment plan. If you just graduated, uh, if your repayment plan for your direct unsubsidized loans lists in school, then you can't yet consolidate them. And we talked about, uh, we talked about this in the new grad student loan playbook a lot, and graduating, consolidating, getting your loans into an income driven plan as soon as you can, but you can't get those loans into an income driven plan uh, until they're officially in their grace period, right? And that's when you can start that uh, direct consolidation loan, end your grace period and apply for an income driven repayment plan. And so this is this is useful information. I would know that this particular student is not yet able to consolidate their loans. So we'll be looking closely for that status to change to grace period so we can start that consolidation and that grace period and choose our income driven repayment plan. And here is one of the most valuable tools on here. So the, the tab that says income driven repayment eligibility these income driven plans are the only ones that have these goofy eligibility requirements, right? So they're based on the loan types that are in here and when you started borrowing. We can see here that this person's eligible for pay as you earn, revised pay as you earn, that's the same plan my wife and I are using, uh, and then income based repayment, the new version that is eligible for people who started borrowing after July of 2014. Um, the reason why we don't use pay as you earn is because we don't qualify for it, right? So we don't meet this qualification standard to be able to use pay as you earn. Otherwise, pay as you earn would be a better plan for our situation, but we're not eligible for it, right? So we use the next best one for our circumstances, which is revised pay as you earn. Now, when we get deeper into the content tonight, we're gonna to talk about how do you know if you should use pay as you earn or revised pay as you earn as an intern resident specialist in the future. And that's gonna have a lot to do with your debt to income ratio. So what's your debt to income ratio now? What do you anticipate and what's your best guess of your debt to income ratio after you finish your specialty training? And that can help us narrow down 
which one we should choose between page one and revise page one. All right. So just to rehash that COVID uh, forbearance period that we're in, the interest rates were all set to zero. There's a, a payment suspension in place through at least the end of this is September. I anticipate that's probably going to be the end of it. Right? We've had this extended now a few different times. It's probably not going to get extended again. I could be wrong, but I just don't get the sense that we're going to extend this uh, much farther than it's already been extended. Um, I do have my last poll for you guys here tonight regarding the pandemic forbearance period. While, while you guys are answering that, I'm going to jump on one of the questions in the Q&A thing here. So how did you calculate the anticipated tax on your loan forgiveness at the end of your repay period so that you can plan ahead and reserve sufficient savings? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm, we're going to go into that, right? So we, we, we're, you can use the BIN Foundation um, Loan Repayment Simulator, taking your student loan balance, your best guess of what your income and your family situation is going to look like, and you can crank out an estimate of, one, whether or not you're going to have a balance forgiven than to what that forgiven balance might look like. And then we can work our way back in terms of calculating a uh, amount needed to plan for the forgiveness. All uh, right, let's see how people have been handing, handling the pandemic forbearance period. Yeah, so great. So most, most people have not been making payments, which is what I would recommend, not making any payments. If you have been making payments during the pandemic forbearance period, you can request a refund of those. Right, so as part of the legislation that suspended the payments uh, for federal student loans, uh, they also made it possible for you to request a refund of any payments made from March 13th is when, when the pandemic forbearance period began. Any payments that you made through the end of this forbearance period, you can request a refund of, and they'll provide those payments back to you. And if you're due to hit forgiveness, uh, or you're not sure, or you can otherwise use those funds to help you shore up other areas of your financial wellness, I would highly encourage you to, um, to request a refund of those payments. Delay on my presentation thing for my presentation. All righty. So what does your income require you to pay? So this is where we want to do a math check. If you upload that file, you'll get an idea of what that payment might have been for you if you've already been in repayment and you want to double check that that's the, what it should be based on the repayment plan that you're using. Um, you can, if you're not using an income driven repayment plan, you can compare what your income would require you to pay versus what you're paying now and see if there's a significant difference. And then, you know, with the pandemic forbearance period, it, it can be often difficult to tell, am I in deferment or am I technically in repayment, right? That's the, that's the hardest part of this pandemic forbearance period is that, you know, if you don't see a repayment plan listed on your student loans, it can kind of raise those questions of what, what am I getting credit for this if I'm working towards forgiveness? And in those cases, if you can't tell, I would reach out to your loan servicer to see if they're, um, they can tell you if you are in fact enrolled in a, in a repayment plan that's, that's earning some kind of qualification towards forgiveness. Based on you know, income and, and what our income requires us to pay, the average internship salary is about $34,000 per year. The average residency is about $40,000 per year. That's data from the uh, 2020 AV Main Economic Report. Uh, and that's from the 2019 graduating class. And that's the most recent data we have available. Uh, specialties, unfortunately, there's not a lot of great information available. Um, there is a little bit coming out. There's some trickles of uh, some reports and surveys of of incomes in, in various specialties that are out there. Uh, so uh, look for those, ask a lot of questions, reach out to your specialty college that you're interested in being a specialist of and ask them if they have some income data. Uh, that's If they get enough of those requests, that's when they're gonna start doing those types of surveys and reports, right? So um, knowing what you expect to earn after you finish your residency not only helps you negotiate that first compensation package, but it helps you in planning for your student loans. So it's really crucial. It's a, it's a huge variable in trying to fill in the equation of what's the best repayment plan for me to use. So when you, when you have your income or you, know, you can use your income 
and your income projections to calculate what your income requires you to pay under an income driven repayment plan. And the Department of Education uses a, a measure called discretionary income. And you pay a percentage of that discretionary income depending on the income driven plan that you choose. Right. So generally speaking, the newer plans require 10 percent of your discretionary income. Uh, the you know, the older the original version of IBR is 15 percent of your discretionary income and then the first version of an income driven repayment plan income contingent repayment uh, was 20 percent. So this this wasn't all that favorable. Not very many people use it. But you take your taxable income right, and you subtract off 150 percent of the federal poverty guidelines. That's the discretionary income formula. So it's pretty simple. Right, so if I have a internship or residency income of thirty five thousand dollars and my family size is one. My discretionary income is going to be about fifteen thousand six eighty, right? So the twelve thousand eight eighty. This is the federal poverty threshold for a family size of one in the lower forty eight states, right? And then I'm going to take ten percent of that, divide it by twelve to get a monthly payment. In the newer versions of income driven repayment, page one, revised page one, these tend to be the more beneficial. Requires me to pay one hundred and thirty one dollars per month. Now, why would I want to pay $131 per month if I can just defer my student loans and pay nothing, right? And that's a, that's a great question, but this paying this little bit during your internship and residency training will prevent capitalization and also get you on track for reaching forgiveness if you're going to reach forgiveness or shorten the amount of time and cost that you'll be in repayment, right? So it's much better to pay this little amount towards your student loans and keep your loans in repayment during that advanced training than to put your loans in the firm and rack up a bunch of interest and have to pay, uh, pay more later. So essentially you wanna go through this exercise. How much does your income require you to pay? Is it currently more or less than you're paying? Again, once the pandemic forbearance period ends. And then you know, what is your taxable income? What does your pay stub say versus what is your recent tax return say, right? So we talk a lot with new grads about having a tax return on file in the fourth year uh, so when you graduate, you can use that tax return to get a zero dollar payment on your student loans for the first 12 months. The same would be true if you're finishing up your internship year from last year, right? So if you started your internship last year and you filed your 2020 tax return, chances are that tax return is, you know, half of what your internship salary was. So maybe $17,000, right? So that's going to also generate a payment of zero under an income driven repayment plan. So you can use that tax return to your advantage in those situations to keep that monthly payment low on your student loans in that in those first couple of years uh, of your advanced training. I did see some people submit some questions about what do I do if I'm married? Uh, it's complicated, right? So does your spouse have federal student loans, right? So my mine does, right? So we're kind of the double, what I call affectionately the double bet, double debt situation, right? So that's going to play into the equation. Um, how do you file your most recent tax return? That's going to depend, right? So if, if you filed, if you got married and filed your taxes jointly, well, then you have to provide your spouse's income as part of the calculation. If you got married after the tax filing deadline and you answer the question that says, yes, I'm married, well, now you still have to provide your income as well as your spouse's income. It's only when you have a separate tax return on file that you might be able to separate your income from your spouse when we're talking about monthly student loan payments. And that's only if you're going to use a plan like pay as you earn or income based repayment. Revised pay as you earn doesn't allow you to separate your income from your spouse, even if you do file your taxes separately. Right. So there's a there's a lot of um, permutations here, and it really depends on how much, you know, of one, are you married? Uh, how did you file your most recent tax return? Does your spouse have student debt? And, you know, all of those kind of roll through this algorithm that then is, well, which repayment plan are you using? And doesn't, is there one that even allows you to separate your income from your spouse if you want to? Generally speaking, the, uh, the tax code, the IRS, uh, the rules that are in place encourage you to get married, have children, file your taxes jointly, right? The student loan repayment rules are set up in such a way that don't necessarily encourage you to get married, but still have children, right? So there's some disconnects there, right? And essentially what you have to do is a cost benefit analysis uh, each year to see which one is going to put the most money in your pocket, 
right? And that can change from year to year. I do, I am finding as I talk about the uh, tax filing status more and more that uh, a lot of people don't even realize that you can change your tax filing status from year to year and, and you can, right? So every year that you file your taxes, you can go through that same decision process. Should I file my taxes jointly or separately this year? Right. How is it going to impact our taxes? How is it going to impact our student loan payment for the next 12 months? Right. So those are going to be the exercises that you go through uh, to determine which is going to be the best, um, best way forward. Tony, I'm just going to take a quick moment here because there is a question that um, relates to something that you asked about previously. Um, should we request a refund of our payments if we only made payments to pay off interest on a loan? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think, you know, it, it, it really depends. Um, I am of the opinion that you can almost always do better things with your money than paying it towards your student loans when there's not a payment due, right? And if you are otherwise happy with your financial plan, right? So you've got a robust emergency fund, you don't otherwise have any other outstanding debt, you know, you feel like you've got a a pretty good handle on, you know, buying a home or buying a practice or, you know, making it through your residency without having to take on any credit card debt, and you don't need that money for any reason, then, you know, you can probably leave it on your student loans, right? Uh, but if you're anticipating hitting forgiveness or even working towards public service loan forgiveness, then, then there's no reason to ever make a payment more than your income requires, which would include the pandemic forbearance period. So I would request a refund on that. Right. But generally speaking, again, I would I would request a refund because there's probably better things I can do with that that money than, than paying it towards my student loans. Um, and one more question. If I use my 2020 tax return that is on file to qualify for the zero, <coughs> excuse me, zero dollar <coughs> per month payments during my internship year, will these payments still count towards PSLF during since the monthly payment? amount was not calcul calculated based on the salary of my of the 501c3 at which I'm an intern? Yeah, that uh, interesting question. So um, the, the, the answer is $0 payments qualify, right? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're using a tax return that doesn't account for the income that you're using at, at working at the 501c3. Um, the Income, so income-driven repayment, we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but income-driven repayment and public service loan forgiveness are, are different, um, but related. So public service loan forgiveness requires you to use an income-driven repayment plan. And as long as you're satisfying the rules of the income-driven repayment plan and those payments are being made while you're working at a qualifying organization like a 501c3, then that payment counts towards public service loan forgiveness, whether it's zero or something other than zero. So yes, you can use that 2020 tax return and have a zero dollar payment. And as long as you're working for the time period that you're making payments working at that 501c3, those, those monthly payments will count towards public service loan forgiveness. Okay, we have one more question, which you've already hit on, but just, I think it's a good idea for you to drive it home. Somebody's asking if I want to make a payment, should that payment be towards principal or interest? And I think that what they're asking is during this time where you don't have a payment due. And I know your feelings on this, but I feel like probably we need to drill it home a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, unfortunately you don't really get to make that choice. Um, now there could be a circumstance here, particularly with students um, that have borrowed. If you just graduated or you're still in school, you could have student loans that don't have interest that have accrued yet, right? Because we've been in this pandemic forbearance period for so long now that you can have loans that don't have an unpaid interest balance, which is actually pretty rare. Um, this is kind of an anomaly. Now, in those cases, if you make a payment, it's actually going to hit the principal because there's no unpaid interest to satisfy. But if you've been in repayment for a little while and you do have unpaid interest on your student loans, you have to be very careful about how you make payments. Uh, because they are first going to satisfy any unpaid interest balance that is associated with that loan. And then if there's anything left over, it'll hit the principal. Just to kind of rehash what Jordan was talking about, if you are going to hit forgiveness, or you, if you're not quite sure if you're going to hit forgiveness, or if you're going to be working towards public service loan forgiveness, it never ever financially makes sense to make payments more than your income requires during that period, right? There are other 
and better things that you can do with your money than paying towards your student loans when no payments are required, right? So I would highly encourage you, particularly, I mean, again, you know, that, that this is really targeted towards interns and residents. Like it or not, I throw you all into the financial damage control scenario, right? It is very hard to make it through an internship residency situation without actually taking on more debt before you get to the point of earning a, a salary that's commensurate with your specialty training, right? So your student loan should be the least of your focus right now, right? Work on other areas of your finances and we'll talk about those later. All right, so how long will you be in repayment, right? And this is, this is one of my, you know, I, I love the comments that people always tell me about this, right? So these are some of the ones that you submitted as part of your questions, you know, like unending, right? Hopefully before I die, being in debt forever. Um, I want to pay them off ASAP. So I pretty much take anything that's associated with time there, right? But the reality is if you use an income-driven repayment plan, uh, particularly one like pay as you earn or the new version of IBR, the maximum amount of time that you're going to be in repayment is 20 years, right? And if you're in one of those plans during your internship or residency, that will count towards that 20 year time frame, right? So 20 years is not unending, you know, you're not going to die in the next 20 years, fingers crossed, right? Probability would say that's not the case. Um, if you don't, aren't eligible for pay as you earn or the new version of IBR, like my wife and I, so we have to use revised pay as you earn that has a 25 year maximum repayment period, right? So this, this will end, right? And it's, you know, will end in probably less time than you've spent trying to become a veterinarian and getting ultimately to where your uh, career goal is. Uh, public service loan forgiveness is even shorter, right? So 10 years, you have to make 10 years of qualifying public service loan forgiveness payments. And if you meet those qualifications, then student loan repayment is over and you don't have to pay a tax on the remaining balance, right? So these are the realities of how long that you will be in repayment. Now you can try to pay them off as fast as possible, but I certainly wouldn't recommend doing that with an intern or resident salary, right? And then you also have to define what as fast as possible means, right? So how, what is the time frame that defines as fast as possible for you? And what will that monthly payment be, right? Now, I, I, when I talk to uh, students and recent graduates, um, I, I talk to you all about how, you know, it already takes us a long time to become a veterinarian. Right? We're kind of behind the eight ball when it comes to a uh, long-term financial planning, right? So you want to start that as fast as possible. If you extend that another three, four, or five years with specialty training, right? You're even further behind the eight ball. Right? You may have a higher income coming out of there, but you really need to play some catch up in terms of your long-term financial plan, right? So you don't want to be too aggressive with your student loans. You need to be more aggressive with some making up some of that time on that long-term financial plan. Right? Your student loans will take care of themselves. You'll either pay them to zero because your income allows you to before you reach this maximum repayment period, or you'll hit forgiveness because you've hit the maximum repayment period, pay the tax and be done with student loans. Right? Either one of those is fine, but if you're going to hit the forgiveness, just be prepared for it. Right? So that's the only difference. So loan balance, you can, hit, you can use an income-driven repayment plan and not hit forgiveness. Right? You can have a high enough income in an income driven repayment plan where you'll end up paying your student balance to zero before you reach forgiveness, or you may not, right? It all depends on your income and what you end up doing uh, as a veterinarian. Okay, now, two time questions, to Johnny. Yeah, um, one, do we need to do anything to ensure that the past month since forbearance apply towards PSLF since the unusual, since the, besides the usual employment verification? Yeah, so I would continue to do the usual employment verification. Now they may not, uh, they may not process that until after this forbearance period ends. I've been kind of waiting to see what they're going to do on that myself, right? So, um, it, it, I mean, the legislation is clear, right? This time that we've spent in the forbearance period, as long as you are continuing to still work for an eligible uh, public service loan forgiveness employer, will count towards that qualifying time, right? but getting them to recognize it is probably going to take some time, right? So once the pandemic forbearance period ends, I would submit that employment certification form and make sure that they're counting that time, right? I don't, I mean, it, it, the one point, what are we up to now? $7 trillion federal student loan repayment system was never meant to be turned, in, turned on and off like a switch, 
it's going to take some time to make sure that everybody is is getting accounted for correctly, right? So, you know, bring some persistence, bring some patience, but yes, that time will count as long as you're otherwise meeting the requirements for public service loan forgiveness. We just have to stay on top of those loan servicers to make sure that they're reflecting that. Okay, and next question. If we will yeah. not hit forgiveness, does it make sense to make payments to the interest during this forbearance period, or should we still request a refund and not make any payments until forbearance ends? Yeah, so, uh, you know, again, that one is going to require a deeper dive into your circumstances, right? So where are you when you're training? Um, what is your debt to income ratio now? How does the rest of your financial wellness plan look? Again, I, you know, it's starting like a broken record here, but you know, one of these days I'm going to write a book and a hundred things that you can do with your money other than paying your student loans, right? <laughs> well, it there, sounds there, like this might be a good question to ask on the boards as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I but it really does kind of, you know, I, I don't want to be too, too blunt here, but just based on the, the 10 years of kind of looking at our colleagues, uh, financial status, everybody could use a little help with their financial plan, right? So it sounds like if you're not going to hit forgiveness, that's great, right? Your, your, your loans, you're going to take care of your loans in a reasonable amount of time at a reasonable cost, right? There's probably other areas of your financial plan that you can focus on using this forbearance period, which again, this is, this is like, this is crazy how beneficial this forbearance period is for those of us with student loans. Take advantage of that, right? Shore up your retirement plan, shore up your emergency fund, use it to save for the down payment on a home or a practice. You know, all of these other things that, you know, could really use that cash a lot more than your student loans can, just so you can knock a few bucks off the total repayment cost. It's just not worth it. Okay, so how can you use this debt to income ratio, particularly for the internship and residency scenario? Right, so you, if you are, are reasonably competent, now again, this is gonna take some you know, crystal balling, right? I mean, it's really hard to know. I mean, these, the internship residency pathways are, are uncertain at best, right? Particularly if you're just in the internship phase, right? Whether or not you're gonna get the residency, if you have to do another internship and you know, are you, you know, is this really something that you're going to do long-term, right? I mean, those are still things that you might be working towards. Uh, or on just better understanding. But if you think that you're heading that direction and your debt to income ratio is gonna be less than one in short order after that advanced training, then I would encourage you to use revised pay as you earn. Right? That presumes that you're gonna pay your balance to zero before you hit forgiveness, that you're probably not gonna end up in academia or otherwise be eligible for some public service loan forgiveness track. And the reason why repay is better in that circumstance is because it comes with a 50% unpaid interest subsidy. So while you're earning 30, 40 grand a year as an intern or resident and making minimal payments that aren't covering your interest, the government will cover half of that interest, right? So if you think about if I just deferred my student loans, all of that interest is going to accrue, 100% of that interest is going to accrue and that's going to get added to my principal. If I use repay, if I'm making little or no payment, the government's going to cover half of my interest. So I'll cut that interest in half versus a, a deferment, right? And it won't then get added to my principal if I keep those loans and repay, which means I'll pay that balance to zero sooner and I'll save more money by doing so, right? Now, so that's a, that is a very specific strategy that you can use income-driven repayment for those of you that anticipate having a debt-to-income ratio less than one after that advanced training is complete. If you anticipate your debt to income ratio is going to be greater than one, then use pay as you earn, right? Even after the advanced training, use pay as you earn, right? Pay as you earn is the most flexible. Therefore, it is the best plan for handling uncertainty. Uh, it also leaves the door open for you to qualify for public service loan forgiveness um, if you end up in academia or otherwise working for some other qualifying uh, public service organization. Right now, you don't get the 50% unpaid interest subsidy. Right, so the full amount of interest is going to accrue. It still won't get capitalized, right? Because you're still in repayment versus using deferment. So you may not ultimately pay the least amount possible using a plan like pay as you earn, but it will give you the most flexibility to absorb more of that uncertainty.
okay, so what is the best way to pay your student loans, right? This is the, probably the most common question I get. So best is not always the fastest and the fastest is not always the cheapest. And this is a phenomenon that is unique to your federal student loans, right? Your federal student loans are unlike any other debt that you're ever going to have the rest of your life, right? No other loan is going to allow you to pay based on your income and have this magical forgiveness provision that will cut the remaining balance by 70% or more, right? So that just doesn't exist anywhere else. So you don't want to treat your student loans like you would other loans, right? This is why you can do other things with your money that are almost always going to be better than paying extra towards your federal student loans. It's because of these benefits that come with them. So when I answer this question, it has three, three variables. Right, so it reduces the risk to myself and my family, it maximizes my monthly cash flow, and it reduces ideally my total repayment costs. Now, I may not get all three of these, but I know I can get the first two every time. Right, so when I say reduce the risk to myself and my family, nobody else is ever on the hook for your student loans. Right, if something should happen to you and you're not able to pay them back, or the worst should happen to you and you're no longer here, right, your student loans go with you your family is never responsible for them. That's not the case with a lot of other debt, right? It may not even be the case with a private student loan, right? So you have to be very careful there. Uh, maximizing my monthly cash flow, right? I, I know that I don't, uh, I'm never gonna pay more than 10% of my taxable income, right? So that gives me the other 90% to do with it what I see fit. Right, so income driven repayment allows me to maximize my monthly cash flow so I can meet all of those other longer term or even shorter term financial goals where I can earn a higher return on that investment. Now, for some of you, particularly those of you that have debt to income ratios greater than one, and definitely for those of you that anticipate having debt to income ratios greater than two for most of repayment, it will also reduce your total repayment costs, right? And now in those, in those cases where we talked about uh, having a debt to income ratio less than one and using revised pay as you earn and assuming that all works out as planned, that will also reduce your total repayment costs while giving you the first two benefits here, right? So this is all about flexibility, right? All about flexibility and reducing the risk to yourself and those, of you, those around you. So coming back to these time-driven and income-driven concepts, these are the two primary methods you have for taking care of your student loans. So time-driven is pretty much traditional repayment, right? This is the, the type of repayment that everybody is familiar with. Uh, your private, all loans, private loans are pretty much a time-driven repayment schedule. Your federal student loans can also be paid on a time-driven repayment schedule. So these are like the default standard 10-year plan, or you can extend it out to 15, 20, 25, or even 30 years. But basically, they take the principal, the interest, and the amount of time that you agree to pay it back, and that calculates the monthly payment required to extinguish that balance over that specified period of time. Now, a time-driven with time-driven loans, the more you pay, the sooner you'll be done with payment and the more you'll save, right? But that doesn't always translate into an income-driven repayment strategy. Income-driven repayment is only eligible for your federal student loans, right? At least in this country. There are some mortgages that operate on an income-driven schedule overseas, but there's nothing else here in the U.S. that I'm aware of that allow you to pay based on your income. And there, there are, these are the different options that are available, right? We covered that when we uploaded our My Student Loans file. Uh, um, sorry, we uploaded our student aid data file into the My Student Loans tool. When it comes to refinancing, right? Now, if you only have private loans that can be paid on a time-driven repayment plan, then sometimes it can make sense to refinance those private loans with a more beneficial private loan, right? When it comes to refinancing your federal student loans in, with a private loan, uh, that can be extremely risky. You have to be very careful with that because the terms of a private loan refinance are not going to be the same as the terms you have now with your federal student loans, right? They're not going to be nearly as beneficial. Now, you might get a lower interest rate, right? Maybe, right? After you're done with your specialty training and you can document some higher, um, some higher earnings and you have a pretty good credit score, right? But a lower interest rate is not the end all be all when it comes to your student loans. And you know, for reasons that we may not get a chance to go into tonight, even if you have a lower interest rate on your student loans, it may not guarantee that you're gonna pay less in total or pay less per month, right? So the income-driven plans are th that much more beneficial, particularly for veterinarians 
um, who have debt to income ratios that are routinely greater than one. This is just to illustrate some of the complexities within this income driven repayment world. Uh, you don't have to memorize this. I just want you to know that this exists and you can go on the Venn Foundation Student Debt Center and look for this. Um, if you kind of get stuck on, well, which plan should is really the best for me, you can start to look at the different features. But all of this is built into the loan repayment simulator, right? So we'll take into account all of this stuff in the calculations that run behind the scenes of the loan repayment simulator. So you don't have to worry necessarily specifically, but when you get down to, oh, uh, you know, I got marriage on the horizon and I started off and repay and my future spouse might have student loans and they're going to use an income driven repayment plan too. Maybe I should switch back to repay. Um, I'm sorry, maybe I should switch back to pay. You know, that's when this is going to become highly useful. Right, is really understanding the differences between those plans um, when, the, when, your, when your situation starts to get more complicated. Okay, so side effects. So this is, this is probably, you know, th these, these are the, the risks of having student loans and then also using income driven repayment, right? So again, you're gonna have risks associated with either income driven repayment or a time driven plan, right? So, but the income driven repayment risks are different than the time driven repayment risks. So income driven repayment can have this negative amortization, right? That's where you can have a monthly payment that's actually less than the interest accrues. Thus, you can see your balance increase over time and that can drive people crazy, right? Now we can treat that. And what drives people crazy actually is one of the reasons why an income driven plan can actually be less expensive in the end, but it still doesn't change the fact that it drives you crazy, right? So it's just one of those things where you have to know more about how it works run it through the simulate, uh, run it through the VIN Foundation Student Loan Repayment Simulator so you can see that it actually is beneficial, even though it feels like you're just treading water or even drowning. Capitalization is one of these side effects that I see happen all the time that most people don't even notice, right? So when they, there are certain events that we're going to talk about in just a minute here that can trigger your unpaid interest getting added to your principal, right? And the higher your principal balance, the more interest you're going to accrue over time, the more you're going to pay towards your student loans. So you want to minimize these capitalization events uh, to the extent possible. Traumatic statement syndrome is really just the fancy medical sounding term I use for driving you crazy, right? So when you watch your student loan balance increase over time, as I have watched mine and my wife's balance increase over time, it can be maddening, right? But I also know that this is the best financial strategy going forward for us and allows us to have the most robust financial plan. So that's how I come back. And then we have this forgiveness, which is another one of those things that people generally freak out about, right? So forgiveness, I got to pay a tax. Oh my God, I hate taxes. How am I going to plan for it long-term? I, you know, just generally head explodes, right? So, but we can use, and that's why we built the loan repayment simulator. So you can keep updating your circumstances and keep planning, seeing how you are on track, how you're doing, and as all of those other areas of your finance grow, this becomes much, much less of a stressor. Now, time-driven strategies are also gonna have side effects, right? They're typically gonna have higher monthly payments. They may have a cosigner, particularly if you're gonna to try to chase one of those really low interest rates, they may sucker a, a cosigner in, right? That's how they're gonna offer you that lower interest rate. They're gonna say, hey, well, if you bring your spouse to the table who's got a pretty good in income and credit score, we'll cut your interest rate in half. Right? But now you've just put your spouse on the hook for your student loans, right? That's not a good thing. Um, they have limited relief provisions. So if you experience something other than consistent or increasing income, time-driven plans can be really hard to maintain. And you can still have traumatic statement syndrome on a time-driven plan. So unpaid interest, this is probably the biggest thing that I want to make sure that all interns and residents are aware of, right? Because you are going to accrue unpaid interest during your advanced training. Uh, it's unavoidable, right? It's, it's going to be next to impossible for you to cover the interest on your student loans while you're being paid an intern or resident salary, uh, nor is it probably a good idea to try. Right. So, and you probably don't want your spouse or significant other trying it as well, right? Because that means that they're sacrificing other areas of their financial plan, right? So if your monthly payment is less than the interest that accrues, then you will have unpaid interest. That's just how it works. Uh, but 
you're still considered to be in good standing as long as you're meeting the minimum monthly payment on those student loans. All right, so when they pull that credit report and they, they pull that credit history and it shows that you've made your payments on time, it will not negatively impact your credit. If anything, it'll help build your credit because you're making on-time payments and satisfying the monthly payment that is due. You are not going to be charged interest on that unpaid interest as long as you keep it from capitalizing, right? And that's your goal as you're working your way through an internship or residency is to keep that unpaid interest from getting added to your principal. In time-driven repayment plans, there is no unpaid interest, right? You're not allowed to have unpaid interest. That's actually the definition of default, right? So you can't use a standard 10-year plan and not at least satisfy the interest, right? Now, deferment is a different story. If you put your loans in a deferment, you're not technically in a time-driven plan. You're in deferment, so you'll rack up unpaid interest. But because time-driven plans abhor unpaid interest, they will take that interest that accrues during that deferment and they'll add it to your principal. So capitalization is different from compounding, right? Capitalization is a distinct addition of your unpaid interest to your principal, right? Compounding would be continually adding your unpaid interest to your principal. Federal student loans do not continually add your unpaid interest to your principal, right? So they do not compound. Right? This is a really common misconception with federal student loans and why everybody wants to pay them off as fast as possible because they keep telling everyone that their federal student loans are compounding. They're not compounding, right? They operate on what's called simple interest. So what causes capitalization? So there are a handful of, of triggers that will cause this unpaid interest to get added to your principal. Entering repayment, right? After you graduate veterinary school, whether you consolidate your loans or you enter deferment or whatever the case is, after you graduate and officially enter repayment and your grace period ends, they will take your interest from school and add it to your principal. You, there's no way around that, right? One of the reasons why we recommend consolidating as soon as you can after you graduate is so you can for, to lower the amount of interest that actually gets added to your principal, right? Because you're still going to accrue interest during that, that grace period normally. The other ones that are really big are changing loan status, right? This is where deferment comes in, right? Deferment is a change in loan status. If you go from in school to grace period to deferment, those are changes in loan status. That's what triggers the capitalization. If you go from deferment into repayment, that's a change in loan status that triggers a capitalization, right? So that's why you need to avoid that deferment. Now, the only exception here is this pandemic forbearance period. Forbearance also triggers these types of things as well, except for this pandemic forbearance period, which is a complete anomaly in the history of student loans. Changing repayment plans is another big one. If you can avoid it, try not to change. There are specific circumstances where it can make sense to change once, right? But you shouldn't be changing repayment plans often, right? One time, maybe. Right, so kind of the example I used earlier, maybe I started off in repay thinking that I was going to go on to do a surgical specialty and it didn't quite pan out. Um, and now my debt to income ratio is greater than one. I thought it was going to be less than one. I'm going to switch from my repay strategy to pay you earn and keep my loans in pay you earn. Right. So that would be an example of switching once. Right. But you don't want to keep switching back and forth, particularly if you have unpaid interest because it will capitalize that interest. Failing to renew, so this is just part of the game, right? If you're gonna have payments that are based on your income, the game requires you to provide income documentation at least yearly, right? If you don't provide that income documentation, that's another trigger for that unpaid interest to get added to your principal. So set reminders, follow up, make sure. I did have somebody ask about the financial hardship provision. So I think they called their loan servicer and said, I, you know, Somebody mentioned qualifying for financial hardship after graduation, not sure what that means. So what that means is if you have an income that generates a payment using an income driven repayment plan that's less than the standard 10 year plan payment, then you are eligible or actually you qualify uh, for a financial hardship, right? And that's the case for anyone graduating from veterinary school that has a tax return on file and particularly anybody that's heading into an internship or residency. 
right? You would have to have very, very, very low student debt balance to not qualify for financial hardship, right? So you can tell that by uh, putting your student debt balance in the student loan repayment simulator, look at what the standard 10 year monthly payment is. And as long as pay as you earn, revised pay as you earn, IBR generates a payment that's less than the standard 10 year plan payment, then you are in financial hardship by definition. Okay, so post-graduation deferment. Right, so this is, again, after graduation, I'm not talking about your in-school deferment. You don't want to play with that. But after you graduate, particularly for those of you in an internship or residency, you know, this is that, that knee-jerk reaction for uh, deferring your student loans, and you really don't want to do that. So what if you do, right? What if you do do that, right? So I, I came up with a little bit of a scenario here. So let's say we've got a 2021 grad, uh, uh, veterinarian with about $250,000 of student loans. Maybe their weighted average interest rate is around 5.75%, which is what I would anticipate it to be. Um, internship at $30,000 per, per year for one year, residency $38,000 for three years, specialty board certification, starting salary of about $175,000 per year. Right, so again, you feel free to fudge any of these numbers to more closely align with your circumstance, but this is how you can walk through this, this scenario analysis. Right, so let's say that you defer for those four years. Right? I'm going to defer my $250,000 of student loans, which means I'm not going to have a payment for the entire time I'm in deferment. I have about a 5.756% interest rate. That's going to generate $60,000 of interest on that $250,000. Right? And after I come out of that advanced training, they're going to take that $60,000 and add it to my principal. Now I'm going to have a principal of $310,000 that I'll start to pay after that advanced training is complete. And let's say I'm going to, maybe I'm not sure which repayment plan I want to use. I'm torn between a standard or an income driven repayment plan afterwards. Right? So we can look at this. Right? So this, that ugly looking link there, this allows you to save, the student loan repayment simulator allows you to save your simulation links. So that's, an, that's a unique link to this simulation that I ran. So you can generate those with this save share button here. But if I look at that situation, right? So now instead of accruing interest on $250,000, I'm accruing interest on $310,000, right? And I'm gonna start, if I wanna, you know, maybe I'm earning $175,000, I feel like I can make this $3,400 a month payment, but in reality, my income only requires me to pay a third of that. Right, so I'm going to be really torn here. Do I pay a standard 10 year plan payment? This is what I'm looking at in total. If I pay, pay as you earn, I'm going to have forgiveness to, um, to contend with, right? So which one am I going to choose, right? So this gives me kind of at least a baseline of my, my total costs are going to be somewhere between 408,000 and 485,000. Again, I graduated from school with 250,000, right? So I'm going to come back here. I've kind of got that baseline now. Scenario two, it's the same, same person, $250,000, 5.75, $30,000 internship, $38,000 residency, same salary after the residency. I'm going to use income driven repayment. But again, I'm going to lean towards pay as you earn here, right? Because I don't anticipate my debt to income ratio to be less than one, right? It's going to be probably greater than one. So I'm going to use pay as you earn. So let's take a look at what that simulation looks like. And so this is going to load this up. All right. So now I'm again my my balance. I kept the principal at two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. So I'm accruing interest on a lower principal amount. Right. I still have the um, the unpaid interest. I need to add that actually. So this would actually I made a mistake there. So this would be two fifty. This is going to have the same sixty thousand. Uh, probably a little bit less. Right. Because you're going to make some payments. So it's not going to be full 60, but it'll probably be 55, right? It's not going to be entirely uh, less. Okay, so we have the same income inputs. So here I have a, oops, sorry, and this is actually going to assume, no, you know what, scratch that. I know why I didn't do that. So I'm going to come back here and load that original because I was correct the first time around. Because right, I started this scenario right out of school and I entered Page Warren from that moment, right? So I'm in Page Warren this whole time. So I'm accruing the unpaid interest, but it's happening 
during repayment here, right? And you can see that now this, we can't really pay much attention to this, right? Because you can't achieve the standard 10 year repayment schedule right out of school when four years of that required specialty training when you're earning 35 to $38,000 per year, right? This is going to require more than you're earning, right? So this is actually not attainable. But the next best one is pay you earn, right? Now that's gonna result in forgiveness, right? But it brings my monthly, my total projected repayment costs, even accounting for the forgiveness to 369,000, right? Which is much less than anything that I projected here, right? So this numer numerically illustrates why deferring your student loan during an internship and residency track is not a good financial move, right? You're going to end up, and in some cases, right, if you decided that I, I don't think I can do the standard 10-year plan, I'm going to start my pay as you earn plan then, right? I mean, this is more than $100,000 more, and you're going to be in repayment for another four years than you had to be versus starting the plan as soon as you can and following the payments based on your income and planning for the forgiveness, right? So this is just one illustration. And right? now if you're gonna have a much higher income because maybe you're gonna pursue a specialty that has a higher income, then you may see that repay is a better move for you. But run those numbers and ask questions about those numbers, right? And we can talk about then kind of walking through the probability of, of, of you earning that amount and navigating that specialty and changes to your circumstance like um, marriage and all those sorts of things. For the person who I mean, asked- have a yeah. question I was just gonna ask you, um, which is any tips if you graduate in 2006 and have consolidated loans with a huge balance? Yeah, that's just, that's too broad, right? My tip is to bring that over to the VIN Foundation student debt mess or the student debt message board folder. Um, we'll go through your case in more detail and and we'll, we'll look and see what your options are. Uh, if you you know, that presumes that you're not gonna be eligible for pay as you earn, but you probably will be eligible for IVR and revised pay as you earn. So this stuff still does apply, but it depends on what that balance is, what your income is, what your family situation is. Uh, so I would start with the student loan or payment simulator. And if you wanna walk through those uh, details with more specifics then post that on the VIN Foundation student debt message board folder. You can even post anonymously there, right? So you can get the help and the answers that you need, but we still build that database of knowledge that other people can learn from. So for the uh, for the person who um, for the person who asked about how do I plan for forgiveness, right? So we have a forgiveness planning module, right? So if it turns out that it looks like you're going to have a balance forgiven, right? We can run that through the forgiveness planning module, right? If we have 20 years to plan for it. And we can start breaking that down. That means I have 240 months. If I break that down into monthly payments, and I presume that I put that monthly payment into something that's going to yield a return for me, I'm going to earn interest on that, right? It's going to cost me, in this case, $47,000 to come up with the $64,000 that I need, right? So I knocked about $23,000 off my total forgiveness or $20,000. Right? So that's how my repayment cost is lower here than it is here, right? That, does, that this one does not take into account any investing for the forgiveness and the fact that you're gonna earn a return on that investment to help you get to forgiveness over time. Right? But that's how you can use the forgiveness planning module to help you reach your forgiveness savings target or at least know what it is. that one. Any other questions on capitalization, right? Because that's the big one that in the, the hardest, the hardest part with, um, actually, let me come back to here because I think there it is. I need to come back to, here we go. So the auto deferment, if you're doing a residency at an academic institution, 
oftentimes they're going to require you to do some kind of master's alongside that, uh, which means you're going to be a student again, right? So you're a resident, you're a student. If you're enrolled at least half time, then they're going to try to put your automatically put your loans into deferment again. Right now, you can waive that deferment, right? But you have to know it's coming. Right. And this is where, um, particularly during this pandemic forbearance period, for those of you that are doing a residency now and might be at an academic institution where you're also doing a master's or something, um, your loans might be in deferment and not in repayment, right? Because the system is set up to recognize when the school says, hey, we've got this person who's attending half time classes, they want to automatically defer those loans. Right? So you have to reach out to your loan servicer and tell them, please do not defer my loans. Even though it says I'm in school, I want to keep my loans in repayment, right? So you can waive that deferment, but it's best to do it ahead of time, right? Before you start that residency, before you start the school portion of that residency, so you can head that off. Because once they end up in deferment, they can't really undo that, right? They can put you back in repayment, but it's still going to trigger that one-time capitalization event, right? This, is, this got my wife Right. When she first started her residency at Colorado State, you know, she was in income based repayment. And then all of a sudden we got a statement that said your loans have entered deferment. Right. It's like, what? that shouldn't happen. So we, you know, called and they said, well, the school reported that you were back in school. So that's how it's set up to handle that. So we'd waive that and said, well, please don't let that happen again. But we still had to have the pain of the one time capitalization event before we can keep got her loans back into repayment and prevented them from deferring after that. Right. So be careful and watchful of your loan status, particularly during those um, residency periods, right? Because that's that deferment is what triggers that capitalization. So public service announcement, spread the word to your colleagues. Don't defer your loans. So not a question about capitalization, but about loan status. For those who have graduated since 2019 and have never made a loan payment <clears throat> um, due to COVID-19 forbearance, um, we have not entered repayment even if we registered for a payment plan, correct? Ooh, that's a great question. So yes, so the, and I think it would be just that I don't think it'd be possible for a 2019 graduate, but 2020 graduate who graduated into the pandemic forbearance period early on. Theoretically, if you didn't choose a repayment plan, your loans after the grace period should technically be in the standard 10 year payment plan. Technically. The standard 10 year payment plan also counts as a satisfying payment towards forgiveness. Now that is all going to be a little bit up for interpretation once the pandemic forbearance period ends. If I was a 2020 graduate who never chose a repayment plan and I was still in an internship or residency at the moment, I would be really, really worried that once that pandemic forbearance period ends, I'm going to get a monthly sta statement for a standard 10 year monthly payment amount. And you probably don't want that, right? Choose another repayment plan. You can still choose a repayment plan during this pandemic forbearance period. If you never did that after graduating school, then do it now, right? Apply for an income driven repayment plan, right? It'll probably capitalize some unpaid interest that may have existed uh, beforehand or from school, or you know, I, I've even seen that some of the loan servicers haven't uh, capitalized unpaid interest from school, even in those in the case for 2020 graduates. Again, you know, this is going to be messy restarting repayment. Um, but knowing what we do know about the repayment system, if you never have chosen a repayment plan in the past, choose one now, right? Choose one before the pandemic forbearance period ends, because you certainly don't want that payment plan to be the standard 10 year, especially if you're in an internship or residency now. But yeah, great, great question. That, that one's gonna take some, some thought experiment too. Um, I'm kind of waiting to see, and I'm anticipating any month now, we're gonna get some more specifics on what repayment restart is actually going to look like. 
Um, I know they're going to probably kick the can down the road in terms of um, renewing income documentation, but uh, a lot of the triggers that were in place before, particularly for 2020 and 2021 graduating classes, for those folks that never chose a different repayment plan, you know, they're probably still going to default to the standard 10 year plan. Right. And you probably don't want that to happen in the middle of your residency or internship. Yeah, really, really, really good question. Okay, so student loan forgiveness. So the income driven plans forgive, but the IRS does not forget, right? So this is another thing that's a little bit up for debate right now. Um, but for the time being, you have to plan as if any amount that's forgiven under an income driven repayment plan is going to be treated as taxable income. Thus, you're going to have to pay some income tax on that when that event happens, right? We have had some legislation that passed recently that exempted student loan cancellation from being treated as taxable income, but that's only if your loans were canceled between 2021 and 2025. Almost nobody is going to experience loan cancellation between 2021 and 2025. Right, unless there's some kind of special loan cancellation that either the president or this Congress does, um, then that would be covered under that recent provision. But for most of us, based on when the income driven plans have started, um, it's nearly impossible to hit any kind of student loan cancellation between 2021 and 2025. So that means you have to presume that the original rules are going to apply, which is that any amount that's forgiven is going to be uh, canceled and that you're gonna to have to report that canceled amount in your tax return and you'll pay the tax uh, based on the income tax rates that you fall into at that time. Now that's not the case for public service loan forgiveness, that's different, right? You don't pay taxes on public service loan forgiveness. If you are, right, if you run your simulations and every time you run a simulation, you end up seeing a balance forgiven, then plan for it. Right now, you may not be in a position to plan for it during an internship or residency, but start planning for it as soon as your budget allows. Right, the more time you have to plan for it, the easier it is going to be to reach that target. Is it going to be a tax bomb or a tax discount? Right, everybody loves to call it a tax bomb, but every time I run those situations through the simulator it ends up resulting in a significant discount, right? So you can call the tax bomb if you want, but if you do end up experiencing it, they're going to cancel X amount of dollars, and then that is going to end up on your tax return. The top marginal federal income tax rate right now is 37%, right? So the absolute worst case scenario for your federal taxes would be that you pay 37 cents on the dollar of what is forgiven, right? If somebody's gonna give you a 63% discount on something, that's a pretty good deal, right? And, the, and in reality, you're probably not gonna end up paying the 37%, it's gonna be something lower than that because it's not gonna push you into the top marginal tax bracket. So you're gonna get an even bigger discount than that, right? So um, forgiveness numerically is extremely beneficial, right? So you just wanna be, prepared for it. You don't want to be surprised when you get the 1099C in the mail that year that says that you had, you know, X amount of thousands of dollars canceled of your student loans. All right, so let's talk about public service loan forgiveness because this is the tax-free version, right? So same terminology, different tax result, right? So public service loan forgiveness after 10 years of qualifying payments doesn't have to be consecutive. Uh, can make you eligible for tax-free forgiveness. This does require you to have the right loans and the right repayment plans while working in the right jobs. All right, so the right loans are direct loans. All right, so that's why you want to obtain that file, upload it into the My Student Loans, see if you have loan types that are not direct loan types. Right, so that person from 2006 graduated from 2006, you probably have loan types that might not have direct in the name. Right, you want to know that. For the example that I uploaded earlier, that person had direct loans, but also had $29,000 of health profession student loans. Health profession student loans are not direct loans, right? So if you think you're going to be 
working towards public service loan forgiveness, you may want to consolidate those into a direct consolidation loan so you can make them eligible for something like public service loan forgiveness or income driven repayment. Right? That's how you can clean some of this stuff up. You can know the loan types you have, see which ones are eligible for income driven repayment, which ones are eligible for consolidation that might then become eligible for a different type of income driven repayment or public service loan forgiveness on top of that. Public service loan forgiveness is completely different than the income driven plan forgiveness that we just talked about that can result in a tax. Public service loan forgiveness requires you to document your qualifying payments and then apply and be granted this tax free forgiveness. The income driven taxable version of forgiveness doesn't require that. Right? While you do have to satisfy the annual income requirements, once you hit the maximum repayment periods, your loans are going to get forgiven, whether you want them to or not. Right? It's strictly based on how many payments you've made and whether or not you've reached that maximum repayment period. Right? So th there's that, that's a big difference between public service loan forgiveness and income driven repayment forgiveness. This is just a basic chart. You know, Academic internships are eligible for, in, um, for public service loan forgiveness while you're making payments towards those student loans and working in that academic internship. Academic residencies, different story. Um, some do. I have, uh, I, I don't have a list of those yet, but the, there, and it, and it seems like it changes too, uh, depending on who's administering them or who's asking. Um, but theoretically, academic residencies can, and I believe should, be eligible for public service loan forgiveness. It all depends on whether or not the HR or a coordinator there is willing to consider you an employee, right? So the public service loan forgiveness employment certification form has a part that you fill out. There's a part that your employer fills out. If they're not willing to call you an employee on that form, then it won't qualify. If they are, then it will qualify. Right? So bring that employment certification form to your residency coordinator or whoever handles kind of the uh, HR paperwork there. Hopefully they've seen one of those employment certification forms before. Um, if not, maybe you're blazing a trail with that residency program. For those of you that are shopping around residency programs, ask them if they are eligible or help you become eligible for public service loan forgiveness qualifying payments during that residency. Um, I, I really wish that it was consistent across the board, but it's just not. Um, in the human field, it is. Right now, it's a whole different ballgame. Most of their residencies are, are administered under a common umbrella that's a 501c3, so it's a lot easier for all of them to be a little bit more consistent. Um, but in that world, this is, this is kind of a no-brainer. Um, in the veterinary world, it's, it's not necessarily a no-brainer. Postdocs, PhD programs, those are even more complicated. It really depends on who's funding those, uh, where your income's coming from, and again, whether or not they consider you an employee. Usually that's much harder, uh, particularly depending on who's funding those. If it's a grant or something like that, I mean, you're, um, you're not really considered to be an employee of that institution. So uh, those are much harder, but still worth asking about and trying. Private practice internships or NCs will never be eligible for public service loan forgiveness. Um, if you go on to work in, government, academia, 501c3, then that time will definitely count towards public service loan forgiveness as well. Here's a link to that employment certification form. Bring that with you. So these were some interesting questions that came up specific to public service loan forgiveness. So will it still be granted eight years from now? Uh, yes, absolutely, and, and more so. Right. So we've seen some hiccups uh, in the early years where it's finally been around long enough for people to apply for it. And there's been some bumps in the roads, no doubt. However, a lot of those obstacles were structural that most people couldn't do anything about. Right? A lot of those obstacles have gotten removed um, simply by how this, the uh, student loan system has changed over time. And anybody that's graduating now it's, it's a heck of a lot easier to be eligible for public service loan forgiveness than if you graduated 15, 20 years ago, right? So um, the same mistakes that people are getting dinged on now are, are not even really possible now. So we are going to see more people qualify for public service loan forgiveness, and we have. That's what's been happening. You know, when it first became available and the first people were applying, something like less than 1% actually were granted. 
we're up to five percent now. So I mean, it's it's accelerating slowly, but it's accelerating, and it's we're going to see more and more people uh, be granted public service loan forgiveness um, in the coming years. Uh, public service loan forgiveness versus paying off after residency. So that really depends, right? It really depends on your student debt balance. It depends on your income um, after your residency and whether or not you're projected to have anything qualify for public service loan forgiveness, right? So again, one of the requirements for public service loan forgiveness is you pay based on your income. Right now, if your income generates a payment that's going to pay the balance to zero before you hit public service loan forgiveness, then there's not gonna be anything left to forgive, right? But it certainly doesn't hurt to try, right? You never know what can happen. Um, you would rather have the time logged than try to um, go back later. It, it's a little bit harder um, to go back in time. So I would still use an income driven repayment plan. And if you end up paying the balance to zero, congratulations, right? If you end up getting public service loan forgiveness and the remaining balance is forgiven, congratulations, right? Either way, you didn't pay more than 10% of your income towards your, your student loans. Uh, this one here, the public service loan forgiveness and the tax bomb. Uh, so there is no tax bomb with public service loan forgiveness, right? Public service loan forgiveness, again, legislatively states that you're not going to pay tax on whatever's forgiven, right? It exempts that canceled debt from being subject to uh, taxation, right? So there is no scenario where public service loan forgiveness will all of a sudden be taxed, right? It, it doesn't exist, right? The law is actually written in the exact opposite way, right? So, um, Public service loan forgiveness and taxes don't go hand in hand. Now, it is an interesting conundrum, should you hedge your bets, right? Maybe I think I'm gonna work towards public service loan forgiveness, should I still plan in case I move away from public service loan forgiveness so I'm still working towards some kind of tax? You know, only you can make that decision, right? That's gonna really take that crystal ball, how confident are you in, you know, staying in the public service realm for that 10 year requirement or are you kind of thinking that you wanna explore other pastures in the private realm. I mean, it's, it really depends on how you're leaning um, in terms of whether or not you should still be planning for some kind of tax uh, while actively working for public service loan forgiveness. Okay. Coming in the home stretch here. So prognosis, good, right? Student loans, um, again, if you take an approach where you limit the amount that you pay towards your student loans based on what you're earning, you're gonna be just fine, right? It's okay to make payments on your student loans using your income. Loan repayment will end, right? You'll either pay the balance to zero because your income allows you to do so. You'll hit public service loan forgiveness after the 10 years. You'll hit the taxable version of forgiveness under pay as you earn in 20 years or 25 years and revised page you earn, loan repayment will end, right, one way or the other. Your income will allow you to pay your balance to zero or it won't, right? It, it, doesn't, really, it doesn't really matter either way. It's not like there's some um, award or anything for doing it one way or the other, right? Either outcome is okay because it ends in a zero student loan balance, right? If you anticipate reaching forgiveness, pay the minimum and plan for the tax, right? That's going to be the most financially beneficial way of handling that, right? Now, if you're going to pay the balance to zero before you hit forgiveness, then it may make sense to pay a little bit more aggressively as your income and budget allows, right? Not for that. Flexibility is really key here, right? You know, the financial wellness part that we're gonna talk about now, these are the things that you should be working on as soon as your budget allows. Building an emergency fund, having at least three to six months of expenses, probably six months is a better accurate, a better estimate after, you know, kind of going through the pandemic period here, right? You want to have more rather than less on hand just to handle the what ifs. Starting retirement savings. Again, we're kind of behind the eight ball. Start with at least 10% of your gross income, if not more. Even during an internship and residency, if you have some budgetary flexibility, right? Start your retirement savings. Use a Roth IRA, right? While you have the ability to do so. For some of you that are gonna go on to specialize, you're, you're gonna get priced out of a Roth IRA pretty fast, right? So, but having the ability to do so while you're doing an internship residency period or the year after maybe, 
right? That can help to build that Roth IRA so you'll have some non-taxable income to pull from in retirement, right? So target at least 10% of your income to go into some tax-advantaged retirement account. Pay off other credit card, private loans, other debt first, right? Even if your private loans or other debt have a lower interest rate than your federal student loans, focus on eliminating those first, right? They're less flexible. And if you have an interruption in your income, those are going to be harder to satisfy. So you want to get rid of those obligations before you worry about your federal student loans. Save for the down payment on a home or practice. Uh, again, based on the amount of questions I received about that, we'll talk about how you can do so with your, um, even with your student loans. You don't have to wait until you pay your student loans off to start or expand a family. Again, if you're paying based on your income, your student loan payment is not going to be uh, a punishing amount per month. Reduce the risk to yourself and your family, right? That includes using something like an income-driven repayment plan, but it also requires you to have adequate insurance, right? So uh, to protect against those unforeseen circumstances. Emergency funds act as like an insurance plan as well, right? But you wanna make sure that you have insurance against um, some of those other things that can really put a, a dent in, um, in your, in your long-term earning potential. Right? So that's where disability insurance comes in, professional liability insurance, those sorts of things. If you're going to manage your student loans based on your income and you keep running up against a balance that's going to be forgiven, plan for that forgiveness sooner rather than later. So just to touch on retirement stuff really quickly, uh, these are just the limits and some examples of retirement options that are out there. Right? So I talked about the Roth IRA. Conditional IRAs are also an option uh, with pre-tax dollars, but those limits are $6,000. If you end up working for an organization that has a 401k or a 403b or some other kind of um, employer sponsored plan, like a simple IRA, the, the contribution limits are usually higher, right? And that's a good thing, right? They want to incentivize you to contribute more money towards those accounts so you're better set up for retirement so you don't have to just rely on social security, right? So there are tax incentives built in for you to try to reach these maximums and try to work your way towards them, right? You don't have to hit the maximum um, immediately, but try to work towards those. These are things that I would encourage you as specialists to do as soon as you can, right? So instead of focusing on how fast I can pay back my student loans, how fast can you start maxing out your retirement accounts, right? That's what you should be doing with that, that increase in income. Always take advantage of matching contributions. That's becoming more common. Thankfully, in veterinary medicine, we're seeing more types of things like 401ks uh, with matches. Um, you always, always, always want to contribute at least the maximum to uh, get the maximum employer contribution, right? So you do not want to forego those. Always take advantage of those matching contributions. And again, try to even contribute beyond that until you reach these IRS contribution limits. What this does is it reduces your taxable income, right? Which reduces the amount that you pay in taxes to the federal government, but it also, because they use that same measure, it reduces the amount that you pay towards your monthly student loans, right? So you can free up some cash flow by doing this and you'll have more, um, you'll have more funds available when you reach those retirement years. You'll be able to grow, experience that compound growth over your retirement funds um, to help you reach those goals sooner. When it comes to buying a home, cash flow is king, right? So they are going to care more about how much are what's coming in each month and what's going out, right? Your total debt balance, while it's a consideration, is a minor consideration in the overall application, right? So they're more concerned with your cash flow, right? So if you are dedicating too high a percentage of your cash flow, to your student loan payment, it's going to be harder for you to get a loan for something like a home, right? The same thing applies to a practice, right? So that's gonna require a little bit more, you know, what does the practice look like you're targeting or what does your business plan look like if you're starting a practice? How is it going to cash flow? Again, they're gonna look at the cash flow there, uh, but all of this is going to require cash, right? In order for you to buy a home, in order for you to start a practice, to buy into a practice, you're gonna to have to have some cash reserves. And if a lot of it is going towards your student loans, you're not going to have those cash reserves, right? And the bank's not going to look at you and say, oh, look at how good you are paying down your student loans. They're going to say, wow, where's your cash, right? So you want to have more cash, even if it means having a higher student debt balance, so be it, right? That's going to actually help improve your ability to get financing for something like a home or a practice, right? So if you're paying 
using a traditional repayment plan towards your student loans and that monthly payment is a punishing amount, right? So it looks like more than 10% of your ins on your monthly cash flow, it's gonna be harder for you to obtain that additional finance. Okay, so let me just come over this stacking incentives one, right? So this just drives the, the idea home of this adjusted gross income measure that is used to determine your taxes, but also used as the proxy for your taxable income on your monthly student loan payment, right? So when you contribute to retirement or you're paying health insurance premiums to protect yourself from having to pay an exorbitant amount of, of health expenses, health savings accounts, flexible spending accounts, all of these things are tax deductible. Right? Because as a society, we decided these are good things. Right? So we're not going to require you to pay tax on those income that you put towards those sorts of things. The more you maximize those types of contributions, the less you're going to pay to the government in taxes and the less you're going to pay on your student loans. To quantify that, if you can get to the point of reaching the $19,500, maximizing your 401k, you can decrease your taxes by about $5,000 per year and decrease your student loan payments by about $2,000 per year, right? That's a pretty good deal, right? And you're experiencing compound tax-free growth on these retirement plan savings. So you're building your wealth and preparing yourself for those later years better than trying to pay down your student loans, right? So the, the numbers work in your favor if you start to look at how all the incentives are aligned. Enjoy life, right? We didn't go through all of this education just to see how fast we can pay back our student debt, right? You have to think beyond those student loans and think about all of those other things that you enjoy doing, as well as all of the other things that you need to be doing to have a more robust financial wellness plan, right? So uh, you can do those things, right? Your, your student loans will not prevent you from doing any of those. Need personalized assistance? This is where that VIN, VIN Foundation student debt uh, message board folder come into play. Uh, I can show you really quickly here how you can get to that. If you use the VIN Foundation Student Debt Center and the My Student Loans tool, if you're logged in here using your VIN credentials so you can, you know, it knows who I am, there's actually a link to the Student Debt Message Board folder, right? It's going to require me to log in here again. Oops. All right, so this is going to take you to the student debt message board folder, right? If you're familiar with VIN, you know, the message boards are kind of the heart and soul, right? This is where our colleagues are helping colleagues and you're getting input and feedback on all of those complex cases uh, that you have going on in clinics. These are, you know, we've extended that same concept to student loans. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of these posts in here, right? Going through people's student loan repayment cases, right? But in this case, you're the case. Right, so we have some instructions here on how you can post. You can see that a lot of these are anonymous, right? You have the option to post anonymously here in the student debt message board folder. Um, a lot of questions now, particularly in graduation season on, you know, consolidation, how that works, what, you know, what that means, how can I end my grace period? How do I ensure that I'm in repayment? All of those sorts of things, right? So you can post your signalment in here, right? Your student debt and income signalment. Uh, what I emailed you guys about earlier today, right? This student debt and income signalment form, right? That helps to collect some of that information that we use to help build out this analysis. But then we really take a deep dive into your specific circumstance using the VIN Foundation Student Debt Center My Student Loans tool, a loan repayment simulator. If you're a student, we'll use the in-school loan estimator, right? So all of those tools really help us hone in on the answers to your questions and hopefully give you a pretty concrete plan to pursue um, after you graduate or after you finish your specialty training. So take advantage awesome, of that. Tony. Yeah. Yeah. Someone wrote in the someone wrote in the chat, cutthroat, um, uh, cutthroat trout. Oh, in the past one, that yeah, that was that one was a this one is a cutthroat. You, you <laughs> for bonus points, you know what kind of cutthroat that is. <laughs> yeah. This, uh, McCaid, do you know what kind of cutthroat yeah, that is? Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, it was McCaid, one of the ones from uh, Boise or 
whoever's in Missoula, you may know the answer to this as he well. He says Yellowstone or West Slope. Yeah, so it's B there. It's a West Slope cutthroats. This one I caught <laughs> in the uh, North Fork of the Coeur d'Alene, so not too far from uh, not too far from Boise. But yeah, so these are native to that to that neck of the woods. So great. Yeah, that, um, okay. if you get a chance, that North Fork of the Coeur d'Alene, I have never seen a river with more clear water. And they see, I mean, it's almost like there's not even any water there. It's it's amazing how clear it, how, you know, how clear it is. You got Tony talking about his other obsession yeah, now, Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> I get okay, jealous, but I get jealous when I see things like Boise, Idaho, or Missoula, Montana. I start, <laughs> I start wandering. Um, okay. Do you want someone to name this fish now? Sure. If somebody wants to go for it, if we, you know, but I probably should get back to answering some other okay. questions. Okay. So one question that came through, which you know, I know there's been some programs out there that have um, that have helped. Um, associates with this. So is it possible to get employers to help with repayment of loans? And how does that affect what payment plan you qualify for? Oh, yeah, great question. Um, employer payments towards your student loans. That's another one that falls into the it depends category. Um, it comes back to your debt to income ratio. If your debt to income ratio is less than one, then you're more likely to pay your loans to zero before reaching forgiveness. In those cases, those employer payments towards your student loans can be helpful. If your debt to income ratio is greater than one, or you're working towards public service loan forgiveness or otherwise are going to hit the taxable version of forgiveness, then those employer payments towards your student loans are not gonna be helpful, right? For the same reason that we tell you to pay the minimum and plan for the forgiveness, right? Because that's the most financially beneficial way to account for that. If somebody else is making payments towards your student loans above the minimum that you're already making, it's not helpful, right? It would be more helpful if they, if you could opt for those funds in another manner, right? So if they could pay more towards your 401k or they could throw in a contribution to your HSA or cover more of your health insurance premiums, or even boost your compensation, right? All of those would give you access to those funds that you can then use in a more financially beneficial way than paying more than your income requires for your student loans, right? Now, there are rare cases too. I know of a couple of places that um, offer employer uh, repayment plans and they're nonprofits, right? Which means you're working toward public service loan forgiveness and they're making payments towards your student loans and the goal there is to pay as little as you can towards your student loans because you want the maximum forgiven, right? So there's employer payments for your student loans. I'm gonna get in a little trouble here, but in reality, those they're, they're recruiting tools for the employer, right? In many cases, they're not all that helpful for you, the borrower financially, right? And I still think we're kind of working through that as a profession in terms of what's the balance there. Uh, but right now, um, that scale seems to be tipped more in favor of recruiting you than actually making appreciable dents in your student loans. The same, I would say the same reason we're seeing uh, signing bonuses a lot more frequently in veterinary medicine. Um, I would be really hesitant to put most or any of that signing bonus towards your student loans, right? For those same reasons. Are you due to hit forgiveness, right? It doesn't make sense for you to pay more. Right? Are you going to work towards public service loan forgiveness, or maybe there's a potential you end up in academia? Put that money in your pocket and use it to build other areas of your financial plan. Right? Just because you get a little bit of money burning a hole in your pocket doesn't mean it automatically goes towards your student loans. You know, allocate it towards those other areas of your financial wellness before you start making additional payments above what you have to towards your student loans. Another perfect example for the employer payment. Think about in terms of this pandemic forbearance period. It's going to be. 18 months that nobody's had to make any payments towards their student loans, right? But you still get credit towards for forgiveness and there's no interest accruing. If I was receiving employer payments towards my student loans right now, I would not be happy, right? I would want that money in my pocket or in other areas of my financial wellness. And I don't know that they've even considered ways to turn those off, right? They're just doing them because that's what they offer their employees, again, mostly as part of a a recruiting tool, but they're not actually helping all that much unless your debt to income ratio is less than one, which to be honest, those are not the people that need the help with their student loans. 
Right. <laughs> yeah, those, those are, you know, again, it, 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 that's a little bit of a can of worms, but, um, you know, that's how it intersects with, with all of the income driven plans and, and, and how they work financially. Okay, a couple more here. What is the difference between consolidation and transferring loans if you have more than one loan servicer? Example, HPL and DSL loan with one servicer and federal with another servicer. Also, if all loans have different grace periods, when should consolidation or transferring happen? Yeah, so I'm going to call it consolidation, right? So there, uh, let me walk through that in a couple of different ways. So consolidation helps you clean up all of that messiness that you just described, right? Because of all the various ways that we fund higher education, it can get messy, right? And the federal direct consolidation program is meant to help alleviate some of that messiness. So if you have a collection of direct loans or fell program loans, uh, Perkins loans, health profession student loans, uh, loans for disadvantaged students, consolidate them as soon as they're eligible after you graduate. That's the best time to do that. All right, so as soon as they enter their grace periods, consolidate them, right? That also removes all the messiness around, well, some of them have a six month grace period. Some of them have a nine month grace period. Some of them have a 12 month grace period. Forget it, right? It's not worth trying to play the grace period game. Put them all into a consolidation loan as soon as they're eligible, which means they're in a grace period. Waive the end of the grace period, right? So you want them to consolidate the loans as fast as possible and get them into a repayment plan, right? That's the, that's the easiest way to get everything with the same loan servicer eligible for the same repayment plans and all on the same time frame, the repayment time frame, right? That's the easiest way to do it. Now, that's best done immediately after graduation. If you didn't do that immediately after graduation, then stop over to the student debt folder because there's some other things that we have to talk about, right? If you have some of your direct loans that have been in repayment and already have earned some qualifying time towards forgiveness or qualifying time towards public service loan forgiveness, you have to be really careful about consolidating them after that has started, right? Because you're going to erase all of that qualifying time. Right now, in the really messy cases, I've been using income driven repayment for a few years. I still have these health profession student loans, but I know I'm going to end up in academia. I want to get that to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Now we have to be really strategic about how we consolidate it. Right. So you can't just consolidate a health profession loan by itself. You have to include a direct loan with it. So we're probably going to have to sacrifice one of your direct loans in order to get your health profession student loans to be eligible for income driven repayment and eventually public service loan forgiveness. So that's why I say, let's, let's walk through that together. Post that circumstance in the VIN student debt folder so we can look at all of your student loans, account for everything appropriately, look for the time that you might have that qualifies towards forgiveness and make sure that we're not setting you back before we put everything on the pathway to be eligible for forgiveness. Okay, one more question. Um, are the annual partial financial hardship calculations based on the current loan balance on IDR versus 10 year standard at that moment in time, or does it compare the IDR payment of the current balance to the original 10 year STD statement that was initially calculated at the start of the repayment? So the latter. Yeah, so when they calculate the partial financial hardship, it's when you first entered repayment or first applied for an income driven repayment plan. All right, so the first time that you applied for income driven repayment is going to set the baseline for the standard 10 year partial, partial financial hardship. Right, so every time that you renew your income documentation, they're going to compare what that payment is versus what that standard 10 year monthly payment would have been at the first time you applied for income driven repayment. Right? And as long as that income driven repayment monthly payment is less, then that will be your minimum monthly payment. If it's if the standard 10 year payment is less, then they'll set the payment to the standard 10 year plan payment. Right? So in reality, if you think about it, the partial financial hardship test is again insurance, right? When you no longer demonstrate a partial financial hardship, what that means 
financially is the standard 10 year monthly payment is 10% of your discretionary income, right? That's how a student loan payment was designed to work, right? Pay 10% of your income for 10 years, you'll hit zero, right? That's where that comes from. That's why that pay as you earn payment is 10% of your discretionary income. Revised pay as you earn is 10% of your discretionary income. It's to try to approximate that, right? So if you no longer qualify for personal financial hardship, right? As long as that's done correctly, you know, thumbs up, congratulations, right? You're now, you've now reached a point financially where you're paying your student loans how it was designed to be paid. Okay, um, two more ones here. One, um, you said that while you're doing an internship, you can use public service loan forgiveness. Does this mean it has to be a nonprofit or government internship or can it be a private internship? Yeah, so it, it depends on the, the type of organization where you're doing the internship, right? So all of the academic institutions meet the 501c3 or the government qualification for being a public service loan forgiveness qualifying employer, right? But if you're doing a private, if you're doing an internship at a private practice, right? So one that is not a 501c3, one that's not an academic institution, right? That is not going to be eligible for public service loan forgiveness, right? You can still use income driven repayment and work towards the taxable version of forgiveness, right? But private practice internships or private practice residencies are not going to be eligible for qualifying public service loan forgiveness. Okay, last question, which is your favorite question, Tony. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for a veterinary specific financial advisor? Unfortunately not. Then she's saying like, do you, or is it just the messaging board that you're recommending? Well, so again, that, that's, that is a, it, that's a big can of worms, right? So um, I did a presentation earlier today uh, where we talked a lot about uh, building a team, right? There, there is no one person that's going to be able to help you with all of your financial wellness. It just doesn't exist, right? Just like there's not one veterinarian that can answer every question for every ailment that can happen to a dog, cat, and beyond, right? We have various people, various um, specialties within veterinary medicine for handling those specific circumstances. The same thing exists in the financial world, right? So you're gonna want to seek the assistance of a, a CPA or accountant when it comes to, should I file my taxes jointly or separately once I get married, right? Cause you're gonna need somebody to help you understand the tax implications of that, right? That's not me, right? That's a CPA, right? Or a tax attorney or somebody who otherwise specializes in, in in knowing the tax code, right? We can know some generalities and you can understand enough to ask the right questions, but you're gonna need somebody that specializes in that to help you answer those questions. When it comes to long-term planning, right? Those are what certified financial planners are really, really good at. So if you're completely floored by how do I reach my uh, forgiveness tax target or how do I save for retirement? I don't know what any of that looks like, right? Well, that's what a, a financial planner is gonna help you with. I wouldn't recommend that you go to the financial planner and say, tell me what I need to do with my student loans, right? You go to the financial planner and you say, I, I think that income driven repayment is the best plan for me. And I anticipate hitting this forgiveness that's going to require me to pay tax 20 or 25 years from now. Here's what that amount is going to be. Here's my income and other financial goals. Now that financial planner can work with you. Right? They've got enough information to help you fill in the gaps and build a portfolio based on your risk tolerance to help you reach those goals. Right, So you're going to have to build this team of folks that are going to help you answer all of the specifics of those questions once you get to that point of knowing what those specifics are. Right, And then you can use the VIN Foundation, VIN Student Debt Message Board folder and the VIN Student Debt Center to help you answer those questions about your student loans. Right. Am I going to hit forgiveness? Am I going to reach public service loan forgiveness? How much is my monthly payment going to be based on what my best guess of my income is going to be? Right. I decided to file my taxes separately from my spouse. What's my student loan payment going to look like going forward? You can use the student debt message board folder and the VIN Foundation Student Debt Center tools to help you answer those specific questions. Right. And then you're going to put it all together and do it every year. 
different whenever your situation changes, right? This is just, this is a perpetual motion machine, right? It's always changing and you're always gonna have to make adjustments if you wanna stay on top of it. Wonderful. Okay, that is the last of our questions. So we will be sending out everyone that registered for this webinar will get an email within the next couple of days from studentdebt at binfoundation.org. We will be sending you a recording of this webinar along with a PDF checklist and additional helpful links. You will also get a link to this presentation that Tony has been sharing. So all of those URLs in there, you will be able to click on um, and you will get a lot of additional helpful information. Make sure to keep a lookout for that email and check your spam. Um, Tony, anything else that you wanna add? No, thank you, Jordan, for facilitating this. And thank you, uh, Matt and Imani and Miranda for being there behind the scenes. Um, you know, I think this, you know, th keep asking questions, right? I mean, I, I again, I, I was, this is one that I've been always looking forward to doing specifically for interns and residents. Um, you're a hard group to get to, particularly once you uh, disappear from veterinary school, but ask lots of questions. Right. Uh, push back on those, you know, hey, when I was your age, I just deferred my loans. Right. I mean, again, th there are better ways to do these things nowadays. They're more confusing. Right. And they do require you to take a more active role, uh, but they can be extremely financially beneficial um, in the long run. So, uh, you know, keep asking questions, keep using the tools, provide us some feedback on how we can make them better or more useful for you. And good luck. Right. I and mean, there's a the world is your oyster out, oyster out there. So, um, have fun and, and enjoy the ride. Thanks everybody. Thank you.